Welcome to Four Corners. Gina Reinhart is already the world's richest woman, on her way to becoming the world's richest person. She's also well down the road to becoming one of this country's most powerful individuals. Having parlayed her father Lang Hancock's inheritance into massive mining wealth headquartered in the Pilbara, she has made clear she will use her wealth and power single-mindedly to promote her interests. She's bought a big chunk of the 10 television network and now, over recent weeks, an even bigger chunk of the Fairfax Media Group, which includes the Sydney Morning Herald and the Melbourne Age newspapers. As her pile of Fairfax shares has grown, so has her demand for seats on the board, on her terms, which include the right to hire and fire editors. The board has resisted, announcing a dramatic restructure including massive job cuts, hoping in the process to shore up institutional shareholder support against her. The Reinhardt story is fascinating. She's preferred privacy over the decades, but every time she's stepped into the public eye, she's attracted controversy. First, in her 10-year battle with her stepmother Rose Porteous over her father's estate, and more recently, her legal dispute with three of her four children over their share of the Hancock fortune. This is more than family bickering. At its heart, it's about control of the Hancock empire. Tonight, Marion Wilkinson presents a profile of Gina Reinhardt. I should point out that Mrs Reinhardt declined an on-camera interview for the program, but her son John has spoken to us. Gina, what does the future hold for you? Um, does the idea of being a, a millionaireist tycoon lady in the business world, does that bore you, worry you, upset you? Well, these what? are all the names that the press sort of mm. give me and I don't really think of it along those lines. I know that I've got an awful lot of work to do so that I can carry on the work that my father has been doing. Is it going to all come to you? Well, I mean, it's not just me. We have staff, of course, to help, but it's just that I am the only child, so a lot of it does come my way. 36 years later, a lot more has come Gina Reinhardt's way. She's the richest Australian ever. But surprisingly, Gina Reinhardt, like her father, has never actually built and operated a mine in her own right, except for a test pit. She may become the richest person on earth, but I think that she would consider that she had failed and had failed on behalf of her father if she does not actually operate a mine herself. I think it is the holy grail. The thing with uh, Hancock prospecting and with her father, his dream was always to actually own and operate a mine. He never did. And Gina, even though she's a, you know, makes all this money, she actually doesn't run a mine. Gina Reinhardt burst onto the national stage as a mining magnate during the strident campaign to axe Labor's mining tax before the last election. What are we going to tell the Prime Minister? Ax the tax! Ax the tax! Ax the tax! And what are we going to tell those jittery Labor MPs in marginal seats? Ax the tax! Ax the tax! For decades, Gina Reinhart was better known for her bitter feuding than her mining. It's only now, at 58, she is finally set to build her own mine at Roy Hill in the Pilbara. But on the brink of her greatest triumph, she is once again embroiled in conflicts. The most serious is with her own children, who she blames for delaying her dream project. It might not be a Rolls Royce, but it gets me where I need to go. Are you going to get the windscreen fixed? Uh, my lawyers always take precedence of uh, what cash I've got left after that, so windscreen and, and uh, personal safety come, come a distant second, um, unfortunately. Gina Reinhardt's only son, John, once her loyal ally, is now in a brutal battle with his mother. Together with two of his sisters, he has lodged a claim that accuses her of serious misconduct 
over running the trust which holds the children's interest in the Hancock fortune, a claim his mother strongly denies. It's like uh, flying in a thunderstorm in the Pilbara. What is the purpose of the action you and your sisters are currently taking? Well, we're seeking to remove my mother as trustee and get access to the records of the trust. In his first television interview since the case hit the headlines, John Hancock is flagging this fraught battle could open up old wounds in the house of Hancock. If your mother is removed as trustee, who will be the new trustee? Well, whoever's the new trustee will have a duty and responsibility to go back and examine the history of the administration of the trust. Unravelling the bitter feuds that haunt the Hancock family begins here, Hope Downs in West Australia's Pilbara. Today, these rich iron ore mines are operated by the global miner, Rio Tinto. But Rio owns only half of Hope Downs. The other half is owned by Hancock Prospecting. It's the jewel in Gina Reinhardt's crown, making her company an estimated $1.5 billion in profit last year. They were important tenements, there's no doubt. It's now the basis of the, uh, uh, the, the Hancock fortune, if I can call it that. Uh, I mean, it's not the only element of that fortune, but it, it's a very important element of that, that fortune. Named after Hope Hancock, Gina's mother, Hope Downs has embroiled three generations of the family in conflict. But back in 1976, when son John was just born, and Gina was still married to her first husband, Greg Milton, the House of Hancock was united in their quest to mine the Pilbara. All I can do is devote all my time to the business side and to my family and everything else I just sort of forget about. There was never any doubt that she was the heir apparent. The closeness of the relationship between Gina and her father was clearly demonstrated. But what was always in play, and what I think has been evident as, as the decades have rolled on, is the character tray that, if you're not with me, you're agin me, which means that it's a very, it's a, it's a very closed world. Um, and very few people are part of it. And there are many people who have been part of it, who ceased to be part of it, um, because she perceived that they were not 100% with her. Michael Yabsley and a group of young Turks in the Liberal Party first met Gina Reinhardt back in the 1970s. There were half a dozen of us who were heavily involved in student politics. Lang Hancock had made no secret of the fact that he was pretty disenchanted with the generation of politicians at the time, and Lang and Gina were keen to, to develop some relationships. So within that group, there were people like um, uh, Peter Costello, uh, Michael Kroger, Erica Betts, uh, and a number of others, um, and I was part of that, that group. Gina's adoration for her father was on display for his 70th birthday. At 25, she owned a third of his company. On this birthday night, she and her father's old ally, Queensland Premier Sir Joe Bjorki Peterson, lit the candles for Lang's cake. No one could imagine that four years later, Gina Reinhardt's relationship with her father would break down almost irretrievably. For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so say all of us, pray. I just found him to be a real man. He's not made of clay and I find him to be very sexy, that's all. 
Rose Porteous entered Lang Hancock's life as a housemaid, just weeks after Gina's mother died of breast cancer in 1983. In no time, Rose and the 74-year-old Lang were lovers. But she makes me feel younger as part of it, and so on and so forth. No, it's a delightful experience for me. It's all right, hang on. No, no, no. no. Can if you give it to me, I swear to you, can I'll never talk to you for the rest of my Hancock life. <laughs> Two years later, Lang had not only married Rose, but thrown Gina off the family company board and installed Rose as a new director. She's highly intelligent and she's picking it up very, very fast indeed. Um, so I'm very glad that she's uh, adopted that attitude to not just be a sort of a social butterfly, but to actually get her teeth into the, the business. What happened to the relationship between Gina Reinhardt and her father during those years of Lang's marriage to Rose? It imploded. Here is a woman who has been weaned on the message of being circums circumspect. Um, in other words, be very wary of, of people who are trying to take you down in one way or another. Enter Rose Porteous and really all of those messages that she had, that she had heard throughout her childhood and throughout her younger years, for Gina became a reality. She had the, the predatory stepmother to contend with. My husband, Frank Reinhardt, was a very private person. I feel but Gina had also remarried. Her second husband, American lawyer Frank Reinhardt, was 37 years her senior. She would later tell Australian story he was a fabulous husband. He was certainly the finest person I've ever known. He was actually a very, very modest person. Um, I didn't know until after he passed away that he had in fact, um, and a friend of his mentioned it to me, that he'd in fact become top of Harvard College and top of Harvard uh, Law School. Frank Reinhardt had also been disbarred in America. He received a 12-month suspended jail sentence for tax fraud before he met Gina. Lang actually didn't like Frank before he'd even met Rose. He thought that he was this older man who was scheming to get the business. So Gina had got married in um, Las Vegas well before uh, Rose came on the scene and Lang was not happy about that. But she has her own life to leave and she married an American. And she can't run the place in America, so I've got to make other plans. Lang's relationship with Rose enraged Gina and Frank. They first tried to get Rose's visa cancelled. In a furious letter, Gina called her a Filipina whore. Lang retaliated, writing to his daughter she'd become a slothful, vindictive and devious baby elephant. Lovely to have Rose here, of course, tonight. And Lane, you look exceedingly well, and we're glad to see that Rose looks after you well. <laughs> At 78, Lang celebrated his birthday with Rose and a new mining venture. With the help of the state Labor government, he'd signed a deal with BHP to at last build his own mine. It's McCamey's monster the biggest ore deposit yet discovered. <laughs> By now, Lang was spending like there was no tomorrow on his two great passions, Rose and his proposed mine. Gina only saw that her inheritance was being squandered. She was a shareholder in the company, Hancock Prospecting, and he'd kicked her off the board and kicked her out of the company. And she felt that he was spending too much money on her stepmother, and she felt that was rightfully her money. And she thought the company was going to rack and ruin. So she felt she needed to threaten, threaten him. In 1988, Gina hit back 
threatening legal action to remove Lang as head of the company he founded. The fight ended with Lang and Gina signing an agreement. Put simply, Lang stayed as head of Hancock Prospecting until his death. But Gina and her now four children would inherit it. The children's share would be held in trust. A separate Hancock Foundation would hold Lang's share of Hancock Prospecting. On Lang's death, the foundation would go to Gina's children to be held in trust until the youngest turned 25. But despite the agreement, the rift between Gina Reinhardt and her father was far from healed. I don't think it was ever to the point that it was ir irreconcilable, and I think events ultimately uh, would show that. Um, but the, the estrangement was certainly there, um, and it was deep and it was bitter. It's, it's not a very grand house, really. It's a, it's a very homey house. Hi, it's nice to see you. Come on in. After Rose and Lang moved into their lavish mansion, pre de Moor, their rift with Gina deepened. At 82, his health failing, Lang Hancock wrote a new will. Hancock prospecting would still go to Gina and her children. But the Hancock Foundation changed. While it still went in trust to Gina's children, Rose would get half the profits from its mining ventures, which by then included McCamey's Monster and Hope Downs. Rose came along and I think from Gina's perspective stole his affection. Now working in Seattle, Nick Stein Brown spent years as Rose's lawyer, embroiled in the legal feud over the Hancock millions. So what happened was that Lang had a will and essentially it gave half of his estate to Rose and, and half of it to Gina. There were other complications, but essentially that's what it did. Gina was widowed by the time she heard about her father's new will. To her, it was a clear breach of their earlier deal. Six months before Lang died, she decided it was time to set things right. Dad went through, a, you know, a very, very difficult time and, um, you know, the sad part is that I was only there, properly there, in the last few months and I saw that Dad had um, very few people around him he could trust. Gina's then legal advisor began work on a deed that would dramatically change the effect of Lang's will. His name was Alan Camp. After he'd had an opportunity to have a look at the will and how it worked, he then drafted the deed, the purpose of which on Rose's case was to bypass the will, bankrupt the estate and vest the assets under the control of Gina. At a hospital in Perth, shortly before he died, Lang Hancock made two fateful decisions. First, he agreed with Gina to sell his McCamey's monster rights. But the huge profit and future royalties would now go back to Hancock Prospecting, where Gina was about to take over, not to his estate. Secondly, and critically, the deed Hancock signed also gave immediate control of the Hancock Foundation and its mining tenements to Gina's children, with her as trustee. This meant Rose's 50% share of his estate would be zero, because there was nothing left. That was the effect of the deed on Rose's case, to disinherit her, to bankrupt the estate, and it all happened a week before his death. When the dying Lang Hancock returned to Pre de Moor for his final days, his angry wife berated him. Lang, at Gina's suggestion, sought a restraining order barring Rose from his bedside. The move ignited a media storm outside the Hancock mansion. Okay. The 
The next morning, Lang Hancock died. Gina, not Rose, was by his bedside. She would now fight for her father's legacy. Rose was already exposed in the media as a pethidine addict. Now the major crime squad arrived at her door to investigate rumours Lang's death might be suspicious. Inquiries are continuing because there is no death certificate being issued. Lang Hancock's funeral began a 10-year legal battle between Gina Reinhardt and Rose over the Hancock millions. Gina's argument was simple. There was no money for Rose. Her father's estate was bankrupt and Gina herself was left to rebuild a debt-ridden Hancock prospecting. There was nothing in the estate for a fight later on because he'd disposed of um, most of it, or he'd given away, or uh, for whatever, um, you know, most of his uh, things in his lifetime, so there's nothing left in the estate to fight about. But all over Perth, Gina stepped up pressure on Rose by lobbying for an inquest into her father's death, which she insisted was suspicious. Even though I don't when the coroner anything. refused, she lobbied the Attorney General to overturn him. I was approached by various other ministers and other people of influence uh, who uh, had been obviously approached by her to ask me why it was I hadn't uh, made the order that she sought. I don't think uh, Gina has a reputation for giving up lightly. With her future at stake, Gina Reinhardt turned to her old political friends. Michael Kroger and I were, were appointed at about the same time and, and remained on board um, with Hancock prospecting for about the same period of time. It was only in July of this year that we actually got access to the coroner's file and as soon as we did, we considered that there were major deficiencies in the work that was done at the time and that an inquest should have been held. I think Gina felt very threatened and I think she had good reason to feel threatened. She was defending the empire and she had good reason to defend the empire. If Gina found serious evidence that Rose killed Lang, it would end her stepmother's legal claims against his estate. It took seven years, but Gina finally convinced the coroner to agree to an inquest after new evidence emerged. So it was seriously alleged against Rose that she conspired in the Philippines to engage a contract killer or contract killers uh, with the purpose of uh, taking Lang out or alternatively uh, to assist her in some other way to kill him, including poisoning him. The inquest was high stakes for both women. Rose was supported by her husband, Willie Porteous, who she'd married within months of Lang's death. Gina Reinhardt was supported by her son, John. But her savvy advisers, Yabsley and Kroger, were long gone. And the new evidence collapsed spectacularly. A private detective, Colin Pace, previously in the pay of Gina's company, handed over his files to Rose's lawyers. They showed Hancock Prospecting had secretly paid large sums of money to witnesses testifying against Rose at the inquest. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there was one witness, a Filipina, uh, whose name was Louise Black, and she was paid well in excess of $200,000. The contract killers or hitmen, so-called, who were also paid very significant amounts of money. So it was a huge, elaborate network of witness payments, and it was that network that caused the coroner uh, so much of a problem. Gina told the coroner she'd authorised payments for witnesses but said she did not know the details. She told Four Corners most of the money was to provide protection for very frightened witnesses. The payments prompted a review by the new Labor Attorney-General. Looking at it, 
it became obvious that there was no evidence that she had paid people to tell lies. Um, and there's nothing in the Australian legal system which says that you can't pay uh, expenses of witnesses. Now, I think this went so far beyond what anyone could have reasonably regarded as reasonable expenses, and the nature of the evidence given was so bizarre. But nonetheless, there was no evidence that there had been a criminal offence committed. The coroner's findings were a public humiliation for Gina Reinhardt. He rejected the paid witnesses as unreliable. He found Lang Hancock had died of heart disease and renal failure. We are going to need time to review his findings to get a better understanding of his findings. And after that time, we would like to make a public comment. The legal war between Gina and Rose finally settled on confidential terms a year later. Gina kept the Hancock Empire in her iron grip, but it cost millions of dollars in legal fees alone. The sheer amount of litigation, uh, the volumes of lawyers Gina churned through, uh, the money involved, the different jurisdictions all over Australia, in Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia, I've, I've certainly never seen anything like it. Churchlands is one of our first projects. It's a $2.3 million house. Uh, we're really quite proud of it because it's showcased what the material can do. John Hancock no longer works for his mother or Hancock Prospecting. He's developing an environmentally friendly building company. It's not a perfect first day. Yeah, pity about the it? weather, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> But this is but it. This, this is, is the, the yeah. This is Churchland's uh, beautiful house. Yeah. So uh, come in, come in. We'll uh, we'll show yeah, you around. Let's get in out of the way. Exactly. Okay. We've had inquiries from the World Bank for low cost housing in Africa. We've also had inquiries out of New Zealand for the Christchurch rebuild. So we believe that the product has application across the world. I've got the drive and energy to promote this and get the right people involved and the right backers to bring this product to the world. Are they almost finished or...? Uh... Yeah, well, it's, it's getting there. The, um... John is on his own quest to prove himself. He's joined a future building material corporation. His partner, Jerome Naidu, has invented a new lightweight wall panel they hope will cut costs and energy use in construction. But John Hancock is also in the legal fight of his life with his mother over his inheritance. Are you getting any money uh, from the trust that was set up for you at the moment? No, and I haven't for many years. A lot of people would find that, frankly, hard to believe. Well, it'd be nice if I was, but I have all the bad things about having money and uh, none of the good things. He always loved John. Um, and having a grandson, of course, John was his first grandchild, and he, he loved John. Alan Camp, Gina Reinhardt's old legal advisor on Lang's will, parted ways with her years ago. Today, he's giving moral support to John Hancock during his fight with his mother. If the children, uh, John and his sisters, uh, don't consider that the trust is being uh, managed um, properly from their perspective, then they will bring an application, as they're entitled to do, to remove her. And John's perspective is that he has no alternative. The seeds of conflict between mother and son were sown soon after Lang's death. Gina Reinhardt wanted to develop Hope Downs as her first big project, sinking millions into it. It was my father that made all this possible for us. He's the one that found it. He's the one that gave me the early confidence, even though he wasn't here to um, follow through with it much as he'd love to be. But who actually owned the main Hope Downs tenements was a fraught question. 
Lang had transferred them to the control of the Hancock Foundation, which he gave to his grandchildren in trust before he died. Gina was their trustee. In late 1992, not long after Lang's death, the Hope Downs tenements were transferred from the foundation back to Hancock Prospecting, where Gina Reinhardt had the majority of shares. In a strongly worded statement to Four Corners, Gina Reinhardt had justified taking back the Hope Downs tenements because, she claimed, Hancock Prospecting had always owned them. She said they had been transferred improperly for grossly inadequate consideration and against the interests of Hancock prospecting shareholders when Lang Hancock moved them to the foundation. She added the foundation was also hopelessly insolvent and unable to develop them. When she transferred the Hope Downs tenements, Gina Reinhardt was defending the Hancock Empire from legal action by Rose. Twelve years on, Hope Downs was set to become one of the richest mines in Australia, and the children's share suddenly loomed as a source of friction between Gina Reinhardt and her son. This has been a, a very long-term um, family dream. In 2005, Gina Reinhardt's Hancock Prospecting sold half of Hope Downs to Rio Tinto and her billionaire status was sealed. Rio Tinto would take on the enormous job of actually building and operating the Hope Downs mine, making it one of the richest in Australia. But at the signing ceremony, John had been supplanted by his sister, Bianca Reinhardt. John was the first. He had visions of one day running Hancock Prospecting and then he fell out of favour, badly. Then Bianca went into the business and lasted for a few years. There was a lot of friends talk about tensions there that never came out publicly like it did with John. Yeah, yeah, no, really good. Uh, we've actually been flat out the last uh, couple of months. Court so, documents uh, reveal John Hancock was the first child to question his mother about the trust accounts and Hope Downs in the lead-up to the lucrative Rio Tinto deal. Mother and son reached an uneasy truce and John signed up to a family agreement on Hope Downs that confirmed Hancock Prospecting's ownership of the tenements. The agreement would also gag him from ever discussing their dispute. I understand that you are legally bound by an agreement and you cannot talk to us about that. Is that correct? That's correct. I, I'm bound by uh, various agreements. I can't even name the agreements, so unfortunately I can't give you any further information. And these are agreements si that you signed with your mother? That's correct. Fairfax reporter Adele Ferguson has written Gina Reinhardt's unauthorised biography. She found Gina had gagged many former associates and Gina's children under the Hope Downs agreement aren't even allowed to disparage her publicly. You know, it's very hard when you're in battle legally with your mother to not sound like you're being disparaging of her. And what happens if they breach the Hope Downs agreement, what action could she take? For them not to get access to any money in the trust. So it could cost them a fortune? It absolutely cost them a fortune, yes. The children do have around 23% of the enormously successful Hancock Prospecting Company but it was held in trust by their mother under a trust deed that gave her sweeping powers. It was a huge amount of power because she could decide if one child could get nothing, another child could get lots of money, depending on what she felt as the trustee. That was the sort of power that she had. Are you getting any of this money from Hope Downs now? No, we are not. 
Neither you nor your sisters. I can't speak for my sister Ginia, but my sisters uh, Bianca and Hope and myself are not receiving anything. Gina Reinhardt has given big money and opportunity to her children, but largely at her discretion. Last year, this was set to change. Under the Hope Downs agreement, the children were finally due to get at least 25% of Hope Downs profits. And the trust holding their share of Hancock Prospecting was due to vest, giving them more control over their assets. Or so they thought. They were wrong. What happened was um, they got a letter a few days before saying that if the trust vests, um, they would face bankruptcy because they'd have a massive capital uh, gains tax bill. And so the suggestion that Gina made as trustee was that they um, sign a new deed which would give her even more control. And they decided not to. They decided to contest it. When the case got to the New South Wales Supreme Court, it was revealed Gina Reinhardt had extended her time as their trustee for another 57 years, without their knowledge. The trustee was extended to 2068, which would have made the John in his 90s. So that really upset them, as you can imagine. Gina's youngest daughter, Ginia, has sided with her mother in the trust case. And so far, Gina Reinhardt has outmaneuvered her other three children. She has now vested the trust, but she warns they risk bankruptcy if they take up the shares. And they're not allowed to sell their shares outside the family. She now has 76% of Hancock Prospecting. And there's a, there's a funny clause in Hancock Prospecting in the, in the Constitution, which says that the shares can only be sold to the lineal descendants of Lang Hancock. So that means now that he's dead, it means the lineal descendants of Gina Reinhardt. So they can't sell the shares. Gina's old friend, Michael Yabsley, believes the case is hurting her. I think it would be a source of sadness for her, um, notwithstanding the, you know, the fairly clinical corporate and legal portrayal of everything that is going on. Um, I think because of the, uh, the, what I always saw as the, as the close and loving relationship, um, I think it's probably the, la the last thing that, that Gina Reinhardt would have wanted. Gina Reinhardt said in a statement, her work in Hancock Prospecting has hugely increased the value of the assets in the Children's Trust by 40,000%. And she castigated her three children who she said either do not work or do not work full time, but allow disparaging comments to be made for their unfortunate agendas. Obviously, some of those things are quite hurtful, but uh, you move on. And uh, I think the proof is in the pudding. Obviously, I've been involved with a family company for, for more than a decade. Um, now that I've been forced to branch out on my own, I think that the product that I've, that I've associated myself with and helping develop will, uh, will prove it's mustered in, uh, in due course. Has he got guts, do you think? He's got guts. John's got guts. Yeah, so John and his sisters know how costly it is to fight their mother in court. But so far, they're not giving up. I've, I've got quite a few friends in Asia, and one of them offered to help me uh, via a fundraising party in Hong Kong. So he managed to get about 30 people who uh, all gave me uh, a substantial sum of money. He also introduced me later that night to uh, an extremely wealthy Chinese man who is helping me. This is obviously a huge step for you. Um, do you think you're going to be able to follow through with this? There's very little other choice for me at the moment, so I think when your back's up against the wall, you just have to come out fighting. Have you worked all those problems out, Jim? The fight way. with her children has brought yes. the media and so Gina the... Reinhardt into conflict. So the... She fought to keep the case from going public, now she's taking legal action against the West Australian newspaper. 
Uh, Mrs Ron Hart has issued subpoenas against the company uh, and against one of our reporters, um, seeking to have us disclose information that we believe would be a breach of confidence on the part of the reporter. She wants all communications from her son John to the newspaper because he was quoted in some of their reports. Her lawyers told Four Corners this does not amount to seeking confidential sources, but the newspaper believes otherwise. There's no doubt that the end game of this action, if we're not successful in setting the subpoena aside, someone is likely to end up in jail because, you know, as you know and I know, uh, journalists will not good journalists anyway, will not give up sources. The subpoenas have raised anxiety across the media because Gina Reinhardt has also bought close to 19% of Fairfax Media, owner of the Sydney Morning Herald, the Melbourne Age and the Australian Financial Review. She told Four Corners she had hoped to be viewed as a white knight by the Fairfax board. Those who know her well say she wants media influence. The media has always driven her nuts. And you think she wants influence? I, I have absolutely no doubt that she wants influence. Um, it, it has been evident from her from her very younger years, and has been evident in in a lot of what her father had to say that the Australian media does not carry the message or does not carry the right message. Uh, she's again entering into an area that her father decided to do. His view was that he, the mining sector, WA, the North, weren't getting a fair crack of the whip in the media and he was going to, in typical laying fashion, do something about it by getting in there. And you think she's doing the same thing yep. now? Have you expressed scepticism to her about All this? All I said was that I would not invest in free-to-air TV right now <laughs> or a uh, uh, large newspaper because the internet is changing the world. What did she say to that? Got to do something. With Fairfax in serious financial trouble and mass layoffs announced last week, Gina Reinhardt stepped up her pressure demanding three Fairfax board seats for her and her allies. But the board is resisting because she is refusing to agree to Fairfax's charter of editorial independence, which protects the integrity of its journalists. The board cannot interfere with the reporting of the papers. That's been honoured for a couple of decades. Mrs Reinhardt wants to get on the board of Fairfax and break that agreement. Her determination to dismiss the Charter of Editorial Independence has not only alarmed journalists of Fairfax, it has ignited political concerns in Canberra. I think that uh, has very big implications for our democracy. I think we should all be very concerned at this turn of events. She certainly has a, has a commercial right uh, to do what she has done but it appears to be that she will go a step further, not respect the Charter of Independence and reserve her right to direct journalists uh, with uh, instructions that follow her commercial imperatives. Gina Reinhardt is already a powerful player on the national stage. Media ownership would hugely amplify that power. If she finally builds her own mine at Roy Hill, Gina Reinhardt's wealth will soar beyond the imagination of most Australians. But to her critics, she will always owe her success to her father's legacy. Gina inherited her wealth. It is built on mineral resources that belong to you and me and to everyone else. Whatever anyone says about Gina Reinhardt, 
what she has achieved is a juggernaut type outcome and no one can take that away from her and all the signs are that that trajectory will will continue. Gina Reinhardt has taken on all opponents, including her own family, in the quest for her holy grail. It could one day make her the richest person in the world. But the path she's chosen has already made her one of the most polarising people in Australia. Gina Reinhardt continuing a family tradition. Although she wouldn't be interviewed on camera for tonight's story, she has submitted lengthy answers to questions by email, which we've posted on our website. That's the program for tonight. Join us again next week. But for now, good night. <laughs>